Good morning, Goodland Community Church. We're glad to have you here this morning as we continue uh, doing church online, as we continue, all of us continue de dealing with uh, COVID-19 uh, issues. Hopefully everything is well at home. Nobody's too, got too much cabin fever. Um, we're glad that you signed in. This morning I've got uh, kind of a special treat for you this morning. Pastor Scott and I have been calling, um, he's called his worship team, and I've been calling worship leaders I've known in the past, and we've got, we've conned them into doing some worship from home. And so we have our first installment of this. Uh, this is uh, Caitlin and Colton Thompson. The young couple got married a couple years ago. I've known Caitlin and uh, Colton since they were probably in junior high, and they are a great couple. They love the Lord. Um, they're excited about doing ministry, um, and they just uh, do a wonderful job on uh, the way church is a uh, uh, worship team. We've got a beautiful song called Holy Spirit, and uh, we're going to take a listen to that right now. So sit back and, and enjoy the great worship. Experience the glory 
of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence. Well, wasn't that, uh, that was awesome. It's, uh, it's neat to see uh, the, the abilities that God has blessed uh, uh, them with. And I think that uh, uh, really touched my heart, and I know it'll touch yours. Turn with you with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. We've been on this journey since, uh, since Christmas. We started before Christmas, right after Thanksgiving, where we talked about the birth of Christ, the announcement of the birth, the prophecies about Christ, and we followed Christ through his life, through his public ministry, and now here, here all the way. It seems like it's gone quick, just like that. We've looked at so many stories along the way here, and now we're here. We've gone from the birth all the way, and now next week with Easter, we're going to be celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Hopefully you've been impacted by the stories uh, over the last couple months. We've only scratched the surface, honestly. We really couldn't dig deep into all the different stories that were there. But what's neat about the stories that we did dive into is when we get to this point, we're going to talk about the blessed is the king, that there's going to be a celebration that, that Jesus is the king. Now, maybe the motivations weren't quite right at this point in time, but they, they had the right idea. And we're going to dig into that. As we dug into those other stories, it's evident if you've been with us over the last couple months that Jesus isn't just a good teacher. Jesus isn't just a great prophet. He's so, so much more. You can't look at these stories and dig into the stories like we have without realizing that Jesus is the Son of God, the Son of God, meaning that he is God. And he is the King. And we're going to look at this celebration here as we talk about the Palm Sunday and the triumphant entry. And uh, come along with me as we read the passage and as we dive in. Because our theme this morning, we're going to talk about sovereignty. That we need to realize that Jesus is sovereign over our lives. And we talk about sovereignty, we talk about sovereignty as, as a nation, but is Jesus sovereign over your life? Let's read our passage. We're in Luke 19. We're going to start in verse 28. And when he had said these things, he went up ahead, going to Jerusalem. And when he drew, drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he told them. And they were untying the colt, and its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And he was drawing near, already on the way down from the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to them, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. 
In our passage this morning, we're going to see uh, several reminders, and I, you know, use the word reminders, but I think that's probably uh, kind of soft. It's really, we're going to see several impacts uh, of the importance of Jesus' sovereignty. The importance of his sovereignty, not only over this world and this universe, but the sovereignty he should have over each of our lives. I come across this little article on advice from kids. You know, we, get a, we give kids advice, and they often uh, um, follow it or they don't. I have four boys, and I've told many stories about how well they follow advice or don't follow advice, and we've repeated these. But there's some interesting ones here, and I think you'll, you'll find them uh, uh, humorous. Don't let your mom brush your hair when she is mad at your dad. <laughs> I like that one. This one's a good one, too. If your sister hits you, don't hit her back. They always catch the second person. Don't pick on your sister when she's holding a baseball bat. That's a good one. This is a personal favorite of mine. Um, We see this at our house. You can't trust dogs to watch your food. Our dog steals our food off our plates all the time. Don't say the last one there is a rotten egg, unless you're absolutely sure a slow kid's behind you. If you want a kitten, start out asking for a horse. That's a pretty good one. When you're dressed up like a princess, it's easier to act like one. Hey, that's not bad. When you want something, this is, I like this one. And I know you guys out there at Goodland are going to get a kick out of this one. When you want something expensive, ask your grandparents. That's a good one. Wear a hat when feeding seagulls. Yeah, good common sense there. Never try to baptize a cat. It could be painful. And then my last two, these are, these are my personal favorites. When your dad is mad and asks, do I look stupid? Don't answer him. And the last one, never tell your mom her diet isn't working. That's, that's really probably good for us husbands to remember too. You know, advice we get, advice we give advice. Sometimes we're not so good at following instructions, are we? whether we're as adults or as kids. And as we look at our story, we look at the first couple verses, and we're going to take some time this morning and just really pick through these verses and see what they've got to say to us. The first two verses, when they had said these things, he went ahead going to Jerusalem, and he drew up near to Bethpage in Bethany at the mount that's called Olivet. He sent two of his disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you'll find a colt tied, in which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. As we talk about the preparation for the king, He gave instructions. He gave specific instructions to his disciples. And what I like about this story is there's no questioning of the disciples. The disciples that were assigned this task just went about it. And what's interesting about it, too, we can overlook it, but Jesus knew exactly what was going to go on and what was going to happen. He had foreknowledge, again, showing his godness in him, that he is the son of God. He knew exactly where the colt was going to be. He knew how the owners were going to react um, and how it was going to go. But his followers were willing just to follow those instructions. Really, the question we have this morning before us, again, as we talk about the sovereignty of Christ, are you, have you ever felt the feeling that, that God wanted you to do something, but you've kind of pushed it off or ignored it? If God is, if Jesus is sovereign in your life, if your relationship with God is important, then when God prompts you to do something, and we're not talking about this, not be extreme here. We're not talking about, hey, I could be a missionary to China or whatever. We're talking about those little things in our daily life or in our weekly life that God wants us to grow in our walk with him. Has you ever felt like Jesus is asking you to do something? Are you willing to give the time, your time and resources and make them available for Christ to use? We go on in the story and we, we notice the disciples did exactly as they were instructed. They went and obe- they followed in obedience. And I, let's continue on the story in verse 31. It says, If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told. And when they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. I love this. The disciples, they're getting asked to basically go steal a donkey, right? I mean, you're going to go untie a donkey from somebody that that doesn't know what's going on but jesus knew that the owners would be willing and what i what i see in 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 the disciples the followers there this idea of obedience they did exactly as instructed 
And that's really the, our biggest thing with sovereignty, with Christ being sovereign over life, is obedience. We can say, yeah, that Christ has sovereignty in our lives, but if we're not willing to act on it, um, we see their obedience was, you know, obedience kind of defined in a formal sense, but really it was action. It wasn't obedience until they went and got the colt and went and did as they were told. And what's interesting, too, I, I love the colt's owners. They willingly allowed Jesus to use their colt. Well, think about this colt. It's never been sat upon. I, I think that's kind of overlooked. If you're, I'm, not, I'm not a horse person, but I'm familiar with wild horses or, or animals that have never had a saddle or had somebody sit on them. I'm sure it's a weird sensation for them, and they don't prefer it. But yet, they were allowing Jesus to use this. Uh, this animal, something that would be at that time would be very valuable, and they just, without any questions, allowed their resources to be used. I think both in the disciples and the, and the owners of the cult, we see a great example for us of making our resources, our time, talent, and ability, uh, maybe our financial ability, to impact others, to impact the kingdom of God. Because if if Christ has sovereignty over our lives. These things are all available to them. And what we're going to find is we fight that sovereignty often. The disciples, now look in verse 35. It says, And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the, on the cold, they set Jesus on it. This is a big deal, um, this donkey, and setting Jesus on it, putting their cloaks on it. It's really a sign of respect, of honor, of, hey, Jesus, you are our king. And they would understand that. This is a recognition of Jesus as the king. They, you notice their reaction was all the things that Christ had been doing. Everybody's getting excited about all the, the miracles that we've looked at in the past couple of months and all these stories. You can imagine that he's, at this point, a celebrity. Like, have you seen Jesus of Nazareth, the one that goes out and, he, you know, he makes blind people see and the deaf. They've never seen anything like that. We've never seen anything like that since. Right? Because when the Son of Man comes, when, when Jesus Christ comes and makes the impact that he did. So they're, they're recognizing that he is king. But a king deserves three things. Think about King Arthur's court and uh, the knights around King Arthur's court. What would they subscribe? What would we think if we think about that story? We describe three things, I think. One is loyalty. Be loyal to the king. Uh, a knight of the round table would be loyal to King Arthur and the kingdom. They would act in a chivalrous way and, and protect the kingdom and be loyal to the king. They would be obedient. Whatever the king needed to be done, they would follow and pursue. And they'd be available for service. That even though the task might be hard and impossible, they would try to the best of their ability to accomplish the task because loyalty to the king, love of the king, is more important than anything else that was going on in their lives. The question we had to ask this morning, does our life reflect the traits of someone who worships a king? worships the king in this case. Are we prepared to worship the king? A little boy was uh, sick on Palm Sunday, and he stayed home from church with his mother. His father, after a couple hours, came home, was carrying a, a palm branch, and his son asked him, Dad, what is that? And the father said, hey, this is a palm branch. It was Palm Sunday, and it's we uh, the palm branch and we wave it at Jesus uh, you know when he comes they wave palm branches at Jesus when he came in as Trump triumphal entry and uh, we all got a branch today to represent that and the son was downcast he's like I can't believe it the one Sunday I'm sick Jesus shows up and uh, it's interesting to see you know the perspective of a young guy that he's excited that he thought he missed Jesus on Palm Sunday I wish we were all that innocent in the way we went about a relationship with Christ. Because as we look further in the passage and as, as Christ is set on the donkey, let's talk about the celebration that comes. Because really, Palm Sunday is a celebration of, of, of Christ being king, Christ being sovereign over our lives. I think this is a great time to look at the crowd. So as we look at verse 35, we've kind of poked into it a little bit. They brought it to Jesus, throwing their cloaks on the colt. They set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And he was drawing near, already on the way from the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. 
saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. We see several things here. I want to talk about, um, just, just so you know the background, and this is about a two-mile run from Bethany to Jerusalem. It was about two miles. So you can imagine the crowds are starting to swell as he comes through. They hear this commotion. There's, there's Jesus riding on this donkey with the cloaks on it, and they're starting to spread out their cloaks on the path. And you can talk, that, that's really symbolic of them giving their allegiance to the king. Imagine the donkey walking on this, and they're, they're celebrating. We'll talk about the elements in a, in a second. I want to talk about the crowd as the crowd builds. I think there's four components to this crowd. The first one would be the ones that are very, very excited. They would be the Jesus' disciples, the ones that know Jesus, have watched them, that are believers in, in Jesus. They're, they're excited for who Jesus is. They're starting to understand, uh, maybe in a physical way, that Christ is different than everything else. I don't think they quite, at this point, everybody kind of catches the spiritual connotations of what Christ is going to do and how he is really ultimately king in our lives. But they're excited about that. They love Jesus. They're passionate about it. And then there's the curious and lightly informed. People are just around like, hey, what's going on? Hey, let's come and see Jesus. And let's go, yeah, I heard about him, and I, I don't see him in real life. You know, it's like when a parade comes to town, we all want to go see the parade, right? And then there's the rebellious, those that uh, want the government overthrown at that time. They want to get the Roman oppression off them. So they would come, oh, hey, this, maybe this is the guy that's going to throw the oppression off. And so there would be those elements in the crowd, and they're getting excited. And then it would be the opposition, the religious and the leaders, and maybe some of the, the secular leaders that are there, and they're angry because this man, this silly teacher, is getting all the attention that we should have. Who is he? But I think this crowd looks exactly the same as our culture does today. And let me explain the four elements. You've got Jesus' disciples. Those are us believers that are passionate about Christ, that we love Jesus. We, we try to do our very best to serve his kingdom and, and build our relationship with him. But then this is the, the next one, when we talk about the curious and, and the, the ones that are fully informed. I think there's many people that attend our churches or right on the fringes of attending our churches that, that know about God, know about Jesus. Maybe they're exposed to vacation Bible school or Sunday school when they were a kid. Maybe they're coming to a church on a regular or semi-regular attendance, but they really haven't fully engaged in a relationship with Jesus Christ. They kind of know of it, and they think just by showing up to church or just trying to do good that that's good enough. But the reality is we know that that's not good enough. Just being on the edges and, and not fully giving your life to Christ is, is not starting that relationship. Then we have the rebellious, those that, you know, we see that all over our community, right? Those that, that know better, uh, don't. Aren't, don't want to be, uh, are too cool for school, if you want to put it that way. They're too cool to, to give their lives to some silly religion. And then you have the opposition. Those are actively trying to dismantle what the Christian church or the uh, body of believers does in a community. We see that. So, you know, as history repeats itself, we look back, right? And so we see the same issues that Jesus was dealing with in his time, we're dealing with in our time. And so the story is very relevant to us this morning. Let's talk about the praise, is uh, the branches. This is a symbol of rejoicing. As they're waving the branches as Jesus is walking, and they're, they're saying, you know, in some passages, uh, English Standard Version changes it slightly, kind of explains the verses, but Hosanna in the highest, right? They're, they're excited about Jesus and he's coming, and it's a, it's a celebration. The colt is very interesting. Let's turn with me, uh, if you've got a second, and I always cheat. I've got mine marked ahead of time, so I'll give you a second. But this is video, so you can pause. It's not a big deal. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 says this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Does it sound like what's happening right now in our story? They're celebrating Christ. They're celebrating. Uh, they're having a big celebration. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation, is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This was written at least 500 years before this event's transpiring. But to me, this, is, this could be a guy sitting on the sidelines watching this parade if it was on TV, and this would be the commentary he would give on exactly for the events that are unfolding. 
Notice what it says here. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Is he humble and mounted on a dumbbell, on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey? It's meek and on a donkey. Now, in our time, we're thinking, okay, okay, so he's on a horse, on a donkey, no big deal. But it is a big deal because uh, a king, if he came into your town on a donkey, was the idea of peace. If he came riding on a horse, he was coming in conquest, and so he had conquered you. But as he comes on a donkey, he's like, where it's the idea of peace and starting uh, uh, having that peace, uh, a symbol of peace or a, like a peace treaty. Hosanna, the word literally means save us, that he's, he's to save us. The cloaks, this is a symbol of willingness, obedience, and loyalty, as we talked about earlier. So as we see, they're excited, they're hitting the right notes here, but we can understand that they're they're, the people there in this crowd, they're excited for a kingdom here on earth right at that moment. And that's not really what is happening. Here's a misunderstanding. They wanted a physical, physical uh, kingdom right now. No understanding that the king must suffer before he excises his supreme authority. Turn with me to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53. We looked at this briefly uh, last week, and I'm going to read it again. We won't spend a lot of time on it because we've been focused on it. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. It's a description of what the king, this king that they're celebrating now, just a short week later, are going to be yelling, crucify him and hang him on a cross. And he's going to suffer for our sin. He's going to pay that price for our sin. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the gospel message. That's making Jesus sovereign over our life. It's so, so, so important. Jesus is no longer entering Jerusalem as a worshiper, but he's entering Jerusalem as a king. I don't know about you, but uh, um, and when we used to get Sunday papers, when we used to get the newspapers, now there are not too many of them surviving now, but you always look forward, as a kid, I always look forward to the Sunday uh, cartoons. And one of my favorites was Calvin and Hobbes. I love Calvin and Hobbes, that was a great one. But another favorite of mine was the Peanuts cartoons, you know, Snoopy and Charlie Brown and Lucy and Linus. Linus the one who carried the little blanket around all the time. And there's a cartoon of, of Lucy and Linus, and, and Linus is sitting on a couch, and he's all curled up with his little blanket, and he's reading a book. And Lucy's standing behind him, and she has this funny expression on her face. And the caption says this, and he says, uh, um, Lucy says, it's very strange. It's happening, this, this look is happening because I'm looking at you. And uh, Linus says, what happens when you look at me? And she says, um, very calm, you can understand Lucy, you know, her attitude. She says, I can feel a criticism coming on me. Isn't that interesting? Linus ain't doing anything, but as a sister, you got you to gotta say something, right? As a sibling, you got to get them. That criticizing's coming upon her. If we look back into our story, we see uh, uh, that the celebration can't go without criticism. That's kind of like society today. <laughs> Nothing good can come without somebody ripping on it, right? Look at their last couple of verses of our passage this morning. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Notice what the reaction of the leaders, uh, supposed leaders of the community are. Hey, Jesus, don't do that. What are, you, are you allowing them to worship you like this? You need to tell them to stop right now. Renounce what's going on. This is not true. You are not the son of God. You are not God. Don't you blaspheme this way. You're not the king. You can't be the king. You know, this challenge reaches all the way down to today. It's it's it, same story. It's just that we do it in our lives. Jesus, you can't be king of my life. You're not king of my life. We see it, people in our community. 
We sometimes see it here in the church, family. Notice, if you think about throughout history, it's, it's from Adam and Eve it started. Oh, we can be like God. God he's not going to be the only king. We can be king of our own lives. They rebelled against God's sovereignty. Israel, look through the Old Testament. He's talking to Pastor Scott. He's working through a, a series on Exodus. You want to talk about the, the people of Israel, how they were they're supposed to be God's people, but yet rebelled time and time again against the leadership and sovereignty of who God was instead of just trusting them. Every time they trusted God, things went well for them. As soon as they did their own thing, the ship turned. Think of the religious and political leaders of Jesus' time. Every generation has to deal with the rebellious that say Jesus is not king or God. Every generation has to deal with us. My father's generation, my grandfather's generation, we've all had to deal with this idea that Christ isn't king, that he's not sovereign, he's not the guy reigning up there. They reject Jesus' sovereignty over their lives, and that's the ultimate issue. And we've talked about this before. Jesus' reply to him is interesting, because he's like, hey, if these guys don't sing, if this crowd doesn't say that I am Lord and that I am king and, and celebrate, the very road itself, the rocks in the road, creation would scream that I am God, that I am who I say he is. This is an acknowledgement, Christ is acknowledging here that he always was and always will be king. This isn't up for debate. This isn't like, hey, at that moment, we just recognize now he's become king, so now he's king. He always was in control, always is in control, and all we have is to give our sovereignty to him. See, that's the choice we have for, before us this morning. Is Jesus sovereign over your life? This passage has sharpened our awareness of the sovereignty of Jesus Christ and understanding that. I'm going to ask you this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're picking self, that you could take care of yourself. And in this day and age, with the things that we have going on now in our communities, none of us are in control of our, of our end of our fate, of our lives, however you want to put it. And I don't mean to be harsh with that, but the, the reality is maybe this is a wake-up call for us to say, hey, we are, we are finally understanding that we are not sovereign over, over our own lives. And I'd rather place the God of the universe, the Jesus that loves me, made me unique and special in charge of my life because I think he can do a better job than I can. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, you ask him to forgive your sins and start that real personal relationship with him. Make him Lord of your life. That's what you're doing. You're saying, look, I can't do it on my own. I need you, Jesus. I'm going to trust it. I'm going to make you sovereign over my life. That's our challenge this morning. If you don't have a personal relationship, make him sovereign over your life. Ask him to be your personal savior. Maybe you've been a believer for a long time like me. Maybe you've slipped out of the pattern. You, you find areas that you are sovereign over. This is your, you know, it's like uh, back, back hundreds of years ago when uh, Europeans used to sail their little boats around and they'd find a new island or something and they'd put their flag in it. They're staking their claim to that, that that was theirs. That's really what we have this morning as believers. You got your flag, the me flag staked all over different areas of your life. Oh, you're going to let God have Sunday mornings and Sunday afternoons or whatever. But the rest of the time, it's your life. You need to strip that away and give sovereignty to Christ over our lives. Kevin Miller is a, a writer and a, a Christian man. said this, When Jesus comes to town, he often challenges the things that are most dear to us. See, what happens is we develop our relationship with Christ, and it gets deeper. All of a sudden, God's like, hey, tapping you on the shoulder. That, that area in your life that you've been holding on to, that you keep going, is causing sin in your life, you need to give that up. And that's the challenge this morning. Are you willing to open up and allow him to mess with your life? Because when he messes with your life, he's going to make you stronger and better. And it's going to be much more impactful. Let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you. We realize that you are sovereign over our lives. As we celebrate Palm Sunday at home this morning, we are so excited to realize the magnitude and power that you have. Help each of us to strip away those things in our lives that are getting in the way of you having being sovereign over each of our lives. Help us to start that relationship over again if we're struggling, if we just feel like we've gotten so far from you. Just 
we're, we're going to ask for forgiveness, and we know that you will cleanse us from our sins. We ask you to continue to bless those first responders that are out there. They're on the front lines working so hard for us. We're so thankful for those. We ask you to bless those that are working in the grocery stores and all the, all the stores that are supplying the needs that we so desperately need. We ask you to just protect them, keep them safe. We ask you to give the, the, our leaders, whether it's state leaders or, or national leaders, the wisdom and uh, courage to do the right things in this type of situation. We ask that you would turn the hearts of America towards you. Help them all to realize they aren't in control, that we need to turn to you. And may you start revival in our nation today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks. I hope you have a great week, and may God bless you.